Okay, welcome, Mark. Hey, thank you, Ryan, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining. I think everybody's in different geographies. Is that right, Ryan? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's pretty hard to find the time that works for, for everybody. But um, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, now, when I reached out to Ryan, uh, or when Ryan and I spoke originally, he, he asked if I could cover one topic. But I think there was interest that there's two topics, which they work very well together. And in fact, um, what, what I'm doing is combining two separate presentations to deliver those all to you today. Um, the, the, the aim of both of these uh, presentations is uh, one, to understand the theory of outbound, and then two, how to find leads that are more actively buying. And then the, the second half of the webinar will be about the lead sourcing playbook. So I'll cover them slightly at the, in the first one, in the first half, and then I'll jump into to lead sourcing. Now, these are very tactical and pretty actionable uh, playbooks that you can implement yourself or have your team implement. And as uh, we mentioned earlier, all of the slides will be available at the end as well. So um, I've just sent them across to Ryan and they're on view so you can read them when, um, read them when they get sent out. So we'll get started. So um, what we'll cover today in, in the first half is what outbound prospecting is and how it fits into the overall sales process. The four stages of building your uh, lead generating machine. And I've got lots of examples of, of emails as well when it comes to the messaging part. Um, how you can then scale your outbound prospecting. And then I've got a few bonus tips and some content that um, you can uh, take, take on and read a little bit later. Um, I might skip some of the bonuses just depending on, on the timing because like I said, it's the first time that I've combined these two presentations in, into one. So just before we get started, um, just before I'll explain a little bit more about myself. Um, so I've got around 13 years experience in sales and marketing. My first job was actually in sales and recruitment and it was very much a business development role. Um, I then moved into marketing after four or five years of working in sales and recruitment, um, where I worked for uh, venture-backed companies as well as uh, startups. So a real mixture of having gone from having huge budgets to having no budget and being bootstrapped. Um, I took an early retirement and traveled for the 12 months. Um, didn't have enough money saved up, so I did have to go back to work. And what I decided to do was um, become a consultant working with uh, B2B sales and market, uh, B2B companies, mainly SaaS and uh, helping them with their, their sales and marketing. Uh, I focus a lot around marketing automation. Uh, I think that was another suggested topic to Ryan uh, that I can cover another time if, if you'd like to have me back. Um, and then uh, until about last year, I, I started working, I was working as a consultant and I worked for a company called Task Drive. And actually these slides are all from my time at Task Drive. I don't work there anymore. I worked as the chief revenue officer. Um, I decided to, to leave to start my own thing, um, which is a podcast relations agency called Speak on Podcast. However, I'm on great terms with the team over at Task Drive and um, there's a, a bonus for, for you guys here. If you are interested in Task Drive, I can arrange some free leads for you uh, that match your ideal customer profile. So I'll share, share the link to that a little bit later, but you'll notice that all of these slides are branded as Task Drive, although I'm not actively involved on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. So we're here really to, to learn about outbound prospecting. And I wanted to start with um, just a, a definition of what outbound prospecting is. Um, for me, it's a direct marketing channel um, whereby you identify your target customers and then directly reach out to them and introduce them to your company, its products and services. Now, a lot of people look at outbound prospecting as uh, the goal is to book a call or a demo for your sales team. However, my approach is that um, outbound prospecting is all about starting conversations and becoming a trusted advisor to these prospects. I'm sure you as founders and, and as, as business owners have been on the receiving end of so many emails coming into your inbox where they just pitched you straight away and they don't bother to find out whether it's a challenge or something that you're interested in or you need the help with. Um, so my approach is slightly different and I'll go through my messaging um, as well. And one thing to mention as well, whilst I was working at Task Drive, um, I, we had hundreds of, hundreds of customers and I oversaw a lot of their outbound campaigns. Now we didn't do the outbound campaigns. However, I jumped in from a consulting point of view and helped improve them. So a lot of the learnings that I had from that year have been baked into this presentation and baked into any of the advice that I, I give as well. The important thing to remember with um, outbound prospecting is that it's just one strategy, one lead generation strategy. You've got 
SEO, SEM, social media, affiliate and referral partners, uh, even side projects as well to, to generate leads. Um, so you need to understand where it fits, where it fits in with your overall lead generation strategy. And it's the first part of the sales process. And I think any business really, if you break things down, has three simple steps. They need to generate leads, they need to convert those leads, and then they need to fulfill on the promise that they, did, that they promised to the customers or to, to the prospects. And that in its most basic form is, is how a business generates revenue. One question that you might be asking though is, will outbound work for you? And it's a question that I get asked quite a lot. And really the answer is yes. Um, and these are some of the, I guess the trends or, or the patterns that I saw in companies that um, were ready for outbound. So first of all, uh, you need to really be able to articulate your value proposition. Uh, you have to have a good product and service or a high quality product or service. You need to be able to scale the delivery of your service and products. We had a couple of customers that we worked with when, when we actually did do some of the outbound campaigns and we had to stop their campaigns because they were so successful that they didn't have the sales infrastructure in place and they didn't have the customer success infrastructure in place either. And this was for a software company. So you need to make sure that you, you are ready to take on these new customers. It definitely um, makes sense if you've already sold to other customers outside of your kind of friends and family as well. Um, so it might be that you've closed your first 10 customers, obviously depending on the deal size that, that you're working with. Um, but usually outbound should only work when you know you can sell and you know you can close the, the leads that you generate. I typically say that it works for any company whose average order value is around a thousand pound, a thousand dollars per year because there's a cost associated with outbound, even if you're automating a lot of it, um, if you're selling a product for um, maybe only $30 a month at the start price, then there might be more cheaper or, or different channels that you may want to try like AdWords or PPC and, and other PPC and social media advertising. Um, and also you really want to make sure that you have somebody internally who can close the deals that you generate. Now that might be the founder to begin with, so it might be yourselves, um, but at the same time, once you start getting quite a lot of, uh, once the, the machine is working for you, you really want to have somebody in place that can close these deals. And it's oftentimes it will be somebody who might be a full circle sales rep where they can do some of the prospecting and also do some of the closing as well. And <clears throat> you can see I haven't updated these slides, but this should read 2020. So to succeed in outbound prospecting, um, you really need to offer value and give without expecting anything in return. A little bit like what I'm doing here today. Um, I'm not paid to do this. I'm not expecting anything to come out of it, but I want to deliver value to you. To you. And if you feel that, um, let's just say Task Drive could help you, then you may sign up and start using Task Drive, but that's not my expectation. Um, and that's my attitude to, to life in general. And since I've, been, since I've had that attitude, I found the, um, there's been an abundance of opportunities that have come my way. Um, you also need to understand the buyer's journey across the awareness, consideration and decision. So different people are at different levels of, of that journey or different stages. And you need to understand that the buyer's journey has changed significantly, but the role and a salesperson hasn't. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we look at our, um, our sales teams and we just want them to close deals, close deals. But the, uh, the buyer is more informed than ever and they may want to do more of their own research. And um, that is something that you have to factor in. And it's something that your sales people, and again, that might be yourself, um, it's something that you have to be aware of as well. So if somebody is doing a lot of research and comparing you to, their, to, to a competitor, you need to know why your service and your product is a better alternative, because gone are the days where the buyers don't have access to that information. We've all seen the rise of G2 and Capterra and, and other review websites as well. So um, it's, you need to arm yourself or your sales team with the information that explains um, why and how you compare to your competitors. The, the, one of the most important things to remember as well, and this comes from a book called uh, The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. I think it came out in the 80s, uh, but it's still as valid today. And in that, he mentions that only 3% of your market are actively buying at any one time. So what that means is 97% of your market isn't actively looking to buy. Six to 7% may be open to it. 30% of those aren't thinking about it at all. 30% don't think they're in, interested. And 30% do not know that they're, uh, they, they know they're not interested, excuse me. 
Um, so really what you want to do is focus on those 3% that are buying now and that, that 6 to 7% who are open to it. And the lead sourcing playbooks that I developed will cover that in a lot more detail of how you identify these people and how you find these people that are potentially in market for a solution. So we're going to go through building your lead generation machine. And I like to break things down into simple steps. And there are four main steps to building your lead generation machine. The first step is planning. The second is research. The third is message or messaging. And the fourth is launch. And I'll go through each of those stages um, in, the, in the rest of these slides. So when it comes to planning, the first thing that you need to do is have a, tr have a very good understanding of who your ideal customers are. There, you may have seen this written down as ICP, um, and it's different to a buyer persona, so, which you may be familiar with as well. So an ideal customer profile is really about the companies, the businesses that you're targeting. And in order to define the types of companies that you're targeting, you should consider the following filters. So uh, it doesn't have to be all of these, it might just be some. So uh, what level of revenue are they at? Or have they, uh, have they achieved a level of funding? Uh, whether that be Series A, Series B, you might find that your product and service is most suited to more established companies. And that might be around series C or series D. So that might be one of the categories of filters that you determine your ideal customer profile to be. Number of employees may have a big impact. Does your product or service sell to zero to 10 employees? So small businesses, or are we looking at businesses with more than a thousand or 10,000 employees? The location, uh, the industry and the markets that they serve and that they're in, uh, the budget that they, they likely have and the technologies that they're using as well. There's an example that I'll show you in a little while where the person didn't actually qualify me well enough. And it turned out that I was an unqualified lead because I wasn't using a specific technology that they integrated with. Um, and the best way to create these buyer personas and ICPs is to look at your existing customers to begin with. Um, look at what sales you have in your, in your pipeline, what leads you have in your funnel, and uh, what do they have in common? What are the pain, and think about what are the pain points that they share. Uh, and this is a way that you can really build up your ideal customer profile. I could do a whole other presentation just on ICP, um, but in the interest of time, I'll move on to the buyer persona. Uh, I think buyer personas are more widely understood thanks to HubSpot and all of the money they spent educating us about inbound marketing. Um, but really the buyer persona depend, is all about the decision maker that you're trying to reach out to. And you can define these by uh, looking at these criteria. So their job title, their seniority, their location, and also diving deeper into their challenges and motivations. Um, you need to understand where they spend time online and then what communities they belong to. Now, I, I worked with, when I was consulting, I worked with a very sexy business, which is in the washroom services industry. And um, the founder was adamant that he wanted to have a link, um, uh, an Instagram profile and an Instagram campaign. And I challenged him on this and said, I genuinely don't think facilities managers in the UK, um, typically around the age of 40, 35 to 45, uh, male being the majority of, uh, of, of the industry from a demographic point of view are going to be on Instagram. And if they are on Instagram, you're not going to really want to be promoting washroom products to them. So this is really important to understand where your personas do spend time online because you don't want to waste your time or energy um, sharing content or putting in investment in the wrong, in the wrong channels. Another thing to remember as well, when it, especially when it comes to planning or just in sales in general, is that we're human and you are selling to humans at the end of the day. And as humans, we buy to satisfy one of two main needs. And that is either to avoid a loss or a pain or to gain pleasure. Now in the B2B space, then really the best thing to, to focus on is avoiding a pain or a loss because that's typically what people will be motivated by especially as they have roles and they have responsibilities and they have objectives that they need to hit. They, they are concerned that they're not going to be able to achieve those goals. And if your product or solution can help them achieve those goals, that's the sort of messaging that you want to be sharing with them. And that really comes down to finding the pain points. Uh, you want to show your prospects how your product or service will help them avoid that pain or loss. And to find out this information, if, if you're very early stages, you can um, speak with existing customers and prospects and just un get an understanding of why they're motivated to work with you or why did they uh, book a demo uh, for your website. 
Um, speak with your sales team as well. If, if you have a sales team, it could be just yourself, but I have an ongoing document um, with my with my co-founder where we always put in uh, bits of information that we hear from people. Um, a recent example is um, we work with B2B brands and we help them appear on podcasts. And one of the one of the conversations that we had just this week said that we're actually really focused in, on our employer brand. It's not the actual external brand to our prospects because we are going to be hiring aggressively over the next 18, uh, six to 12 months. And we really want to attract new employees. So their motivation right now for speaking on podcasts is to get the name of their company out there, which is a completely different thing to what we were targeting and what our messaging was previously. But we've now added that into our messaging, into our sales deck, and, and we'll be adding it to the website because we, li we listened and we learned from our prospects. And that was somebody who booked a, a call. And um, we think, well, there may be other people that have done that. And now we're going to look at that segment and think, how do we find more companies like this one to then target with that message? So the important thing here, and I guess the takeaway with this is that it's all iterative. It will be moving and changing all the time. And I encourage you to revisit your personas on, on a regular basis. Now, some of you may be in a position where you don't have as many uh, existing customers or maybe just a small amount, um, and you might not have a sales team. So one of the best places to look for the pain points and the challenges that your prospects have is actually to look at job descriptions. Uh, I find LinkedIn is a great place for this. Search for the, the job as if you're looking for a job as the prospect. Um, let's say it's HR managers. And then you can read the job adverts and the job descriptions. And oftentimes they'll talk about what their key objectives are. Uh, I did this work with a, a company recently and they sell employee engagement software. And um, one of the biggest trends that we saw in most job descriptions were that the, the, these people for employee engagement were responsible for rolling out employee engagement programs across, across the company or company-wide programs. So we use that information to create content about, about rolling out employee engagement. Uh, what we did in, in that example as well is that we just spoke to people who had already done it, asked them what they would do differently if they did it again. And then we put together a piece of content which was, um, you know, sounds quite clickbaity, but it worked. It was like seven things to avoid when rolling out a uh, employee engagement strategy. Um, and it was really well received. And we actually led the outbound prospecting with that piece of content. So rather than coming from a position of pitching, we came from a position of giving value. And it turned out that a, uh, that a large percentage of the people that they spoke to were interested in finding out how th this company that, we were, that I was working with could help them roll that employee engagement out. They were an employee engagement software. So that's the, the connection there. One of the other things to think about too is um, to break your prospecting into smaller campaigns because quite simply the same message to multiple personas just, just won't work. So you need to segment your prospects into a lot smaller campaigns, which also can help you personalize the message better too. So an examples of these campaigns might be the location. So is it a location specific campaign? Is there an industry focus? Because if you're communicating with, um, let's use the facilities managers again, um, they, there's very different, the facilities manager at a co-working space has a very different need for a facilities manager at a FTSE 50 company. So they have different challenges. So you want to think about segmenting as much as you can. You might do it by job title or their seniority. It could be based on the company updates, industry updates, or even current events that are happening in, in the market. And it's really important that the, the one thing I would like everybody to take away from this presentation is that the whole spray and pray approach never worked and it definitely doesn't work in 2020 and especially as we're going into 2021. So don't be afraid of having a larger number of smaller campaigns that are going to be hyper-targeted and specific to your core segments of your buyers that you're reaching out to. And, and the last thing to, to, to think about when it comes to sending out outbound emails is to actually use a spare domain so my domain is speakonpodcast.com. Uh, what I will do with my outbound emails is I'll, I'll create a domain called speakonpodcast.co and then run all of my emails from .co. Now, we're not a spammy organization. We don't send high volume. However, there is a risk when you do send outbound emails that your domain could 
uh, could be damage its reputation with people marking emails from you as spam. And one of the ways around that is to create just a separate domain and warm that up as well. Um, if you if you were to search up uh, search for domain warming, you'll get a ton of blogs that are, that show you how you can do that. And what you'll um, and the reason why you don't want to do the, what you don't want to do at the beginning as well is don't send hundreds of emails per day on a new domain on a new domain, because that will kind of trigger the spam filters to say, hold on, these people are spamming. Let's put all future emails from this domain in the spam folder. Again, email deliverability is a huge topic in and of itself. So that's the, the planning stage. And now we're going to move on to research. And really why research is so important is because you're emailing a person, not a prospect. And whilst I might use the word prospect, I still have the understanding that it is an individual that I'm speaking to at the end of the day. So when it comes to research and personalization, there are three main ways that you can, you can think about this or three main levels. And I like, um, I enjoy an IPA, an Indian Pale Ale, so I thought I'd use the analogy. You've got individual, persona, and account. So individual personalization really is uh, about the contact details or job title. It could be recent social activity that you can include in, so it could be a post that they shared on LinkedIn that you can include in the email, job anniversaries or updates. It could be content that they've shared. They may have been on a podcast, you could mention that. And it could be their interests that you've found out about them through their uh, social media profiles, like on LinkedIn. You could see that they play golf, for example. You may want to use that in your outreach. And I've got some examples of this after. Then the, um, on the persona level, you've got current objectives, their challenges, their motivations, their fears, day-to-day -day roles, skills, um, tools that they use. So like I said, understanding the technology that they use uh, and also um, online publications, and relevant content uh, about their, uh, their, their persona. And really, again, what you want to be doing with your outreach is to come across as a human and you want to make sure that you're demonstrating that you've done the research. There's no point sending an information to an IT manager that should actually go to a HR person. Uh, the last level, which I think is probably the easiest level, is to look at the account or industry because that will most likely apply to multiple people within one company. And that could be things such as revenue, the address, the industry, case studies, recent news, awards, technology use, employee numbers, rounds of funding, for example. And I'll show some examples of how these fit in. I actually put together, I think there's over 80 data points here for personalization that I introduced at Task Drive. It was almost like an a la carte menu that people were saying, this is the sort of information that we need. And what we did at Task Drive is we'd go and find that information and present it back to our customers so they could use it in their email outreach. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of a very successful campaign we did was we're working with a webinar platform and what they wanted us to do is have a look at uh, companies that fit their ideal customer profile and our researchers went to their website, this is the, the, the prospects website, and we clicked around and looked to see if they were hosting webinars. Now, if they were hosting webinars, we had three extra data points that we wanted to look for. We wanted to see how often, so what was the frequency of those webinars. Then we also looked at, um, were they gating the webinars? So did they put the webinars behind a form or was it just a click and play and, you, and you'd see the webinar? And the third thing they asked for was which webinar platform are they using to facilitate the webinars? Now, we put this data into a spreadsheet for them and sent it back to their team However, based on those different factors, determined what type of message was then sent to the, sent to the, the prospect. So if the, if the company was heavily leveraging webinars as part of their marketing strategy, the message that went to the individual was, I can see that you're actively investing in webinars, um, and that's how they started the conversation. If it was somebody, a company that only produced a couple of webinars a year, the question was more like, hey, I can see that you've, um, you've run a couple of webinars. Is this a strategy that you're looking to double down on in 2020? And uh, for, for how things went after March in 2020, webinars really kicked up uh, and went off. So all of this, um, all of the data and all the prospecting that this company did, they put them back through a campaign as well for those people that they hadn't spoken to. Um, so that, that's just, I just want to share examples as I go through to, to add some light to, to some of the things that I'm saying. 
And I'm sure we've all received emails like this. This one was a screenshot from my email. It's hi, no name. We make websites, mobile apps, SEO. Lo I don't know how you make SEO as well. Um, logo designs and much more. Best price is guaranteed. Now, I'm sure if all of you are working with Ryan, none of you are sending this sort of email out there. But it still amazes me to this day that people are sending emails like this. And this is a clear example of no personalization, no research done whatsoever. But then there's a fine line with personalization because you might be saying, because you've got access to so much information, you can see people on, on social media, you can maybe see their, their um, Instagram account. And, and interestingly, we had one customer come to us. They wanted us to look at a, a list of Facebook profiles, which they gave to us. They wanted us to go through the profile photos and determine whether this person liked um, to go out and social or, or were they hiking? They wanted us to start categorizing the people. And then if, if we saw photos of them socializing, they then wanted us to say, were they drinking beer? Were they drinking spirits? Or were they drinking wine if they're holding a wine glass? Um, we said no to this because it was a little bit too creepy for us. But what they were planning to do with that data is use some of that insight in their message. And what they were doing was giving out their plan was to give out gift vouchers or to at least invite people out to a happy hour, for example. But for me, it was just a bit too far and we didn't really want to get involved. Um, but here's just a, a jokey um, way of showing that you could personalize an email just by the information that you can see on people's profiles. But it's definitely not a good idea to do this. The one thing I would say also about personalization is, of course, don't go this far. But it really does depend on your market's maturity. So if you are prospecting to teachers, let's say, they may be less savvy than marketers if you are, if you're targeting them. So really, when it comes to the levels of personaliza personalizations that you, you go to, you go through, um, it really does depend on, on that understanding that your market has. Because for me, if somebody as a marketer said, sent me an email saying, hey, Mark, I saw that you were on our website. I know that there's technology out there that tracks my visits on their website. But if you send that to a nurse, let's say, who may not be aware of that, that technology, then it may spook them a little bit. So you have to really keep in mind your, your prospects. And one of the ways that you get this information into your emails is by using merge tags. And uh, merge tags are essentially little uh, snippets of code um, that take the information from usually from one source, which might be a spreadsheet that you've imported into um, one of these outreach tools. I've got some uh, suggested tools a bit later on, and it just inserts the information. Now, the reason why you might, might want to have um, location, company size, web framework, is that, as I mentioned before, when you're segmenting your campaigns, the most of the email might be the same, but you can vary how the email looks by using these merge tags. So if, you were, if your product or service could reach out, could work with large brands and smaller brands, let's just say your e-commerce and you could help large e-commerce brands. If you're reaching out to a small e-commerce brand, you probably don't want to say that we work with ASOS um, because that is probably going to be way too big and quite intimidating for this small e-commerce owner who might think, well, if they work with ASOS, they might be very, very expensive. Um, so what you want to do is make sure that you're um, inserting the merge tags for companies of a, of a similar size. Um, so rather than it being ASOS, it will be smaller, smaller brands. And bonus points if you can even filter that down by industry um, so that it's uh, ASOS is obviously clothing, um, but there's uh, lots of different types of e-commerce businesses out there. Um, so the, the, more, the more granular you go with the data, the more you can personalize and add in merge tags into your emails. Now, I often get asked as well about different data sources, and um, there are several, or about 15 here. Uh, LinkedIn is probably my favorite place to go uh, from, a, from a data source point of view. Um, you've got directories of, of providers and, and, and companies. You've got Google Maps if you're selling to restaurants, for example. Uh, podcasts can be a great place to, to find individuals. Um, Discover.org, similar tech. These are paid databases or paid technologies. I actually talk about similar tech in, in the second part of the presentation. Facebook groups might be a great place. And I, I've, got, I've got a playbook about social expansion as well, which, which I'll go through. Um, but simple Google searches, job boards, these are all different places that you can find the data. But it goes back to the planning stage of where you really need to understand 
your persona and who it is that you're messaging and what they care about. So I just want to talk about lead sourcing here, although we'll go through it in more detail. Um, really, why, why do we want to source leads? And really, we want to build our lists rather than rent or buy lists. Because when you buy or rent lists, they might be out of date, even though the person that sold you them will tell you it's not. They likely are. Uh, and they might, be of, they might have been purchased by other people and spammed to in the past. So their resistance to cold email might be a lot higher because they've been on this list and they just can't get off it. You also want to build dynamic lists uh, rather than static lists. And these dynamic lists, they focus on trigger events. Uh, and these trigger events is what all these lead sourcing playbooks are about. And they really are the moments when a prospect is likely to make a buying decision or more likely to make a buying decision. And, uh, and these also can be updated on a regular basis. So here are the playbooks that we'll run through after. And I'll just give just a real example, just in case any of you have questions right now. An example of a, a, a dynamic list would be targeting people who have just started a new role because every month new people start a new role. Um, so let's just say you're targeting chief marketing officers at technology brands in the US. Every month, new pe uh, people are starting new roles as a chief marketing officer in technology brands. And the reason why you might want to speak to somebody at that time is because they're more than likely evaluating their service providers, their technology, their strategy. They've just started a new role, they're looking to make an impact, and now they're more likely to be in a buying uh, buying uh, stage than, than previously, than somebody who's been in their role for a year and a half, let's say. So you can imagine every month based on that criteria, you'll be able to find 300 new marketing uh, CMOs that has started that new role. So, and again, we'll go through these lead sourcing playbooks in a little bit more uh, in, in the second part of the webinar. Then once you've, once you've done your re, uh, once you've kind of done your research, you need to collate it, organize it, and also make sure that you're validating the emails. So collect all the data and, and organize it into those different campaigns that you plan to send. Um, if you're using merge tags, make sure that these are set up correctly. Um, each email outreach software is different. So you need to make sure that they're going to work with your outreach software. Um, and other things to think about as well is if you've scraped data from somewhere, you want to make sure that you're removing Mr. Mark Colgan. You might just want to say Mark. Um, job titles, some people will say um, Wizard of Outbound as my job title. And you obviously, if you put that into an email, it's going to be very obvious that there's a merge tag. And what you may have noticed on LinkedIn is that quite a few, a few people uh, in their name are putting emojis in there. And that's really just to catch out people who are sending automated messages on LinkedIn. Um, so usually it's best to have a pair of eyes to go through the data and make sure that it's standard. Um, if you're including the company name, make sure you, re you remove LLC or LTD. Um, all this sort of information, you just want a human to go through it and just double check. Um, and then of course you want to validate the emails because you really want to protect your, uh, your domain reputation. So there are a few tools that you can use. They all pretty much work the same. Uh, Never Bounce, Snob and Cleanify are three that I've used in the past with good success. Um, and also for those of you that are outsourcing this to a virtual assistant or even an intern, um, ask yourself who's checking their work. Um, it always needs to be double checked and never take the work that a, a freelancer gives you as 100% confirmed, not, especially not the first time. You, you definitely want to make sure that you're checking the quality of, of their work and making sure that they're validating the emails before anything goes into any of your system. So I'm going to move on to messaging. This is stage three. And one of the things to remember is that um, when, when it comes to building an outbound prospecting uh, strategy, you need to think about your cadence. And a sales cadence is really, um, it's quite a complex strategy which molds your target audience uh, to their needs and also can encompass all of the different channels that you can use, such as um, phone, voicemail, text message, social media, email. Um, and it can, uh, it's also known as like a sequence or a follow-up sequence. And the cadence that you design will have a number of different things to it. So it'll be, so those will be the attempts. So this is the number of times a sales rep um, tries to contact the lead. That might, or you might, you not, sales rep might be you. 
Um, and that could be over these different channels as well. So uh, an email would count as one and the LinkedIn message would also count as one. So that's two attempts. The media, so what channels were used to make contact and, and what was the most successful because you want to be looking at your cadences to ensure that they're working. The duration, like how long is this campaign going to last for? Are you only going to send emails over two weeks? Are you going to send emails over three or is it five weeks? So you need to think about the duration. The spacing, so how much time is uh, allowed between each contact attempt. So if you send an email and make a phone call on day one, when is the next activity? Is it day three? Is it day six? Uh, in two slides time, I think I've, I show an example of a cadence. Um, and then uh, the content itself, the length of the content contained in the emails, in the messages, in the voicemail, you need to have that planned out too. And when it comes to selecting the media or the channels, um, the best way to think about it is if, the, you have, if you have a transactional sale with a short sales cycle and a relatively small deal size, you could probably get away with just using email and social. Um, but if with, with larger, more relational based sales, with longer sales cycles and larger deal sizes, you might start with email and social, but then follow up uh, with more communication like the phone, like video, even direct mail and personalized experiences too. That could be something that you introduce. Um, but the most important thing to remember is to use the channels your prospects use. So um, it's always important to make sure that you are communicating with your prospects on the channels. And again, that comes back to the planning stage where you really understand your buyer personas. Um, typically, this is how I, I explain it to people. So if uh, the, the top number, sorry, I always forget to put the label. That's your, um, your uh, average deal size over a year, sorry. So if it's less than $1,000, then email social and maybe a generic video would work. If we look at the uh, 50,000 to 100,000 range, if that's how much an average deal is for you, then you've got a lot more budget to, to play with and therefore your cost per acquisition is going to be higher, but you can afford to try more channels like personalized video and direct mail. Um, the personalized chat and landing pages is very interesting as well. Um, you have a specific link in your, you have a link for your prospect and it goes through to your website and that page is optimized for them. It pulls through their company name based on the link. Um, that's something I've seen used very effectively. Um, and the, the one that I like to joke about is I, I genuinely want to send a mariachi band to a company's um, offices as part of my prospecting because I think I'll definitely get a reply. Might get a letter from the, the police, but I, I'll get a reply from, from the prospect. Um, but obviously that would cost a lot of money and uh, you'd want to make sure that you do that to, for a deal that is worth, the, the, the value of the deal is worth the investment in the, uh, in, in the messaging. So here are just a couple of um, examples. And as you can see, the, the, on, on the left, we've got a, um, a sales cadence that G2 uses or they previously used. And what you can see is that there's a lot of activity at the very beginning. So on day one, they send an email and a social touch. And a social touch might be that they've just followed somebody on LinkedIn. It might be that they've engaged on a, on a post of theirs. Uh, and then on day two, they call and they leave a voicemail or leave a voicemail if they don't answer. Then on day five, they send email number two, they try a second call, they leave another voicemail, um, and it goes on. And as you can see, there's lots of touch points here. Um, there are some stats, which are, I don't think are in this presentation, but the majority of sales, uh, the majority of sales reps stop sending um, follow-ups after four attempts, but the majority of buyers take action after four attempts. So when I consult with companies and I look at their outbound strategy, most of the time, I think for pretty much everybody that I've spoken to, my answer has always been send more follow-ups or have more follow-up touch points in your cadences um, because they're giving up too early. And if you are truly delivering value and, um, and helping your, your audience by sharing content, then your follow-ups become less pestery. It's not like you're saying, hey, just bumping this email to the top of your list. It's more adding value and giving another talking point to, to speak about. We ran a campaign um, at Task Drive where the third email got the most responses. And it's just because the message resonated more with the audience than we actually realized. So what we ended up doing after seeing that trend that we were getting a lot of responses on the third email, we then swapped the third email with the first email. 
So we started our cadence, we started our emails with this uh, successful message, which meant that we got more replies at the beginning of the sequence for the, for the prospects that were enrolled in that sequence in the, in, uh, in the future. So don't be afraid to change these around. They should always be, they should always be moving. Um, it's, an ex it's a constant experimentation. The, 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 the cadence on the right-hand side is actually from um, Outreach, which is a very good outbound prospecting tool. It's quite expensive. They usually sell to at least five, a minimum of five seats, but um, this is the sequence that uh, works really well for them. And what you can see is that at the beginning, on the first day, they send an email, they follow the person on LinkedIn, and they take, uh, then they make a phone call. Uh, and this is called like the triple combo. And what I've seen in the last six months is that the companies that are using this approach with the three touch points on the first day, and then a follow up two days later by email and phone, are seeing more successes in the amount of meetings booked and also in uh, close one revenue as well. Um, I don't have time to go through this in, in too much more detail, but it will all be the here on the slides for you to, to check out after. So we're still on messaging, and I think there's uh, three golden rules for writing compelling emails. Um, remember, it's not about you, it's about them, the prospect. Uh, remember that you want to start a conversation. You're not looking to sell or close a deal on this email that you're sending to them or the first message that you're sending to them. And also you need to remember to play the long game and become a trusted advisor. Now, if you're not a wordsmith yourself, I'm not a great copywriter, I'll admit that, um, hire somebody who is. Um, they can be quite hard to find these cold email copywriters, but when you find a good one, keep, keep hold of them um, because they're worth their weight in gold. Just like if you're not a plumber, you wouldn't fix a leaking sink or shower. Um, it's very much the same when it comes to copywriting. There is an art to it. And um, if you want some recommendations, there's a few people I've worked with in the past that I'd be happy to introduce you to. Again, I like to keep things as simple as I can, especially in quite a densely packed um, presentation. So looking at the main elements of a cold email, you've got your subject line, your opening sentence, the main body, and the call to action. Now, a lot of people often ask me what the most effective subject line is. And I joke and say, I've got your wife is the most effective subject line to get opened. However, you're going to piss a lot of people off um, by sending that email. So the idea of subject line isn't to trick them, but it is to get them to click an email and open it. And people aren't going to buy, your, buy the product based on your subject line alone. You only need to create enough curiosity so that the email gets opened. And in, best, in the best practice, the, the, the shorter the subject line, the better. Um, make it curious, maybe offer value, make it personal. Um, so as you can see on the left-hand side, we've got name. If you've got it, haunt it. That was used around October. I thought that was quite funny and it, it received, it went a little bit viral. Um, quick question is one. Uh, new office, so new London office. If, if you know that this company's just moved to a new office. That was for a company that we were working with that um, they did visitor registration software. So they often used the fact that a new com a company was opening a new office as the trigger to reach out to them. And they used, that as they used the, this subject line and it worked very well for them. Um, the, the, the last one is what I've used myself personally in a, in a few campaigns. Um, it says, uh, Ryan, how do you do it? Question mark. Uh, that got around 89% open rates. And my reply rate was around 59%, I think it was, which is, ve which is very high. Then moving on to the opening sentence. So the, first, the, the point of the first sentence in your email is to get the prospect's attention and to prove that you did your research. The second sentence is to tie uh, that research and what you said um, to your product or value proposition. But this is perhaps the most challenging part of it. Um, you want to make the first sentence as much about them as possible. And then by customizing only the first two sentences and dramatically cuts down the time it takes to customize these email sequences. So here's an example from Gong. Gong are a, a software that um, allows you to record your calls and they do analytics on, on those calls. So you can see that um, Danica said, hey Mark, uh, I noticed that Task Drive allows your team to prospect less and smash revenue targets. That was actually on my LinkedIn profile. So she took something from my profile um, more importantly, uh, you drive growth through operation, operational efficiency, again, something else that was in my profile. So I can see this is really personalized to me. And then she connects it to Gong and says, in parallel, Gong helps your team smash revenue targets, again, using my own words, out of the park. 
um, gong the revenue intelligence, and then she goes into her pitch. And you know, most of this email will be templated. It will be sent to many other people as well. Um, when it comes to, this is another example from Chorus. They actually have the same products, just a different, different company. Um, and in this one, she's, she's gone a step further, which is why I wanted to include it. And it says, Mark, I've been following you for some time and I noticed that you liked Morgan's post. And she actually included a screenshot um, in the email and sent it to me. I thought this was really good. You can see that that has only been sent to me because it couldn't be sent to anyone else. As you can see, I've underlined it. It says Mark Colgan likes this. So um, it's a really, really good uh, example of a personalized email um, which solicited a response. The thing to remember with Chorus though is that their product uh, typically costs, I think around $60 per seat per month. And if I had a team of 10, that's gonna be $600. So it's around a six to 8,000 um, dollar a month deal size. So they can afford to spend the time to personalize their emails like this. Here's another, in, uh, another example. This was just on LinkedIn. Um, you can see that in my, at the time I said in my headline, I can wax lyrical about prospecting and sales automations for hours. Uh, I really like this approach. This I thought was really good. He said, I see you're claiming to be able to talk about sales automation for hours. I'd like to take you up on that, but only for 10 minutes. I thought that was really smart. And I ended up having a really good conversation with uh, Anthony. So those are just examples of the, um, of the first couple of lines. And then you've got the main body. And uh, really here, I think that the key is to focus on the pain point, resist the urge to pitch your product, um, actually utilize specific and relatable social proof uh, in that message. Uh, don't just list out the, the features of your, of your product because nobody buys features. We, we buy products and services for the outcomes. Um, also paint a picture of their life without the pain. Um, so you could explain how much easier their role would be if they, uh, you know, if they had a solution. Uh, and also make the email relevant to them. <clears throat> when it comes to the call to action, um, the one that I've, I've this, so you saw this slide was from 2019. I've been saying this is the best call to action to use. And only in the last six months have these large companies like Gong and Chorus been saying that from the statistics they have, this is the best subject line. It's known as a soft close. And this, the call to action is, sorry, not subject line. The call to action is, uh, Ryan, would you be interested in finding out more? And uh, another way you could ask this is, uh, uh, Ryan, is this something that is important for you at the moment? And again, the point of a cold email is to start a conversation. And these sort of qu questions at the end help you get a reply, whether it's a yes or a no. And if it's a no, you can start to understand, is there an objection that I need to overcome here? Or some people will say, no, uh, we've just implemented this competitor, um, so we're not interested. But for me, as a, a relatively savvy salesperson, I'd think, okay, They've just started working with a competitor. Let me check in with them in a month's time and see how they're getting on. Are their expectations being met for what they thought they were buying? And have they been happy with that competitor? So I've got some examples here. And I think what I'm going to do is just skip through these examples in the interest of time. I've actually highlighted some of the examples where you can see um, uh, some of those. So you can watch them in the slides. What is often overlooked in outbound prospecting is handling of responses. Um, so you really want to make sure that you're prepared to uh, handle the responses. So handling those replies coming from your cold emails as quickly as you can. Um, it will also significantly increase your chance to get a demo or a meeting. Um, you've just managed to get somebody's attention in a few minutes and you could lose it forever. So the, this is one of the, this is a second thing that I often see when I look at people's outbound is that they just haven't got, um, people responding to the leads quick enough. And as I mentioned before, the money, the money is in the follow-up. It can take up to 18 touches in total to generate a response for a cold prospect. Uh, and most salespeople give up after four touches. When it comes to best practices, um, provide added value. This is for follow-ups. Provide added value, arouse curiosity. Um, your follow-up should be personalized as well. And um, you want to spread them out over time. You obviously wouldn't want to send one email a day for five days in a row. Um, some more tips for follow-ups is do share content. Um, if you don't have any content yourself, there is plenty of other companies that serve the same audience as you that aren't competing with you that you could just get their blog posts. So I could take one from Gong and say, hey, I thought I'd share this with you, Ryan. 
um, because uh, this is the most effective call to, uh, call to action in emails. Wasn't sure if you've seen it, just thought I'd share it with you. Um, but do remove people when they request it. Be concise and transparent. Uh, choose the right time. Um, often, uh, follow up often, five to seven times at least. And add clear calls to actions to your emails as well. Don't, for, please don't say, I'm bumping this email to the top of your inbox. Nobody likes things to be bumped to their inbox. Never make somebody feel bad for not replying to, to your emails. And whether this is for you as the founder or for your sales team is you will develop thick skin. You are going to get some angry responses. Um, some people have stuff going on in their lives, which I'm sure they're working through, but they like to take it out on salespeople. Um, so don't take rejection personally. Um, so this is an example of a really good follow-up uh, sequence. Um, again, just looking at time. So this is the first, first message. Then um, the third email that he sent was um, adding some uh, content and infographic, which was kind of justifying what their pl platform does. Um, he then sent a, a non-pushy fourth email, then a fifth email, which is about an event that's coming up. Dreamforce is quite a famous event in the sales world. Um, so this is all part of his follow-up process. And, but this was the example that I mentioned before where he, um, he, we said, okay, I agreed to speak with him. And then he said, hey, just to clarify, do you use Salesforce? And I said, no, we, we don't use Salesforce. We use uh, Pipedrive. Why did you think that? So he hadn't done his research at the beginning. And as you can see from all of those emails, I sat in his cadence, went through it. He was investing his time in following up with me. And some of those emails would have been personalized um, or customized by him. And it was a waste of time for him because I wasn't a qualified prospect. So again, planning is the most important part. There's some links here. I highly recommend you check out uh, the reply method. Um, some really good email examples on, on the middle link. And Beck Holland of Flip the Script, there's a, a few YouTube videos that she's recorded, um, which cover how to really effectively write and craft your messaging. So we're on to the final stage, which is launch and optimize. So there are, there are a number of different tools that you could use. If you're just doing email outreach or maybe email and social, then Jamelius is a great place to start. It's a very cheap tool. Lemless costs around $60 a month, but it's very good. Ample Market is around $700 a month, but it has uh, data included. Reply.io is one of my favorites because they have really robust integrations with CRMs. The next level up is uh, sales enablement platforms such as Salesloft, Outreach, and Frontspin. All of these are great platforms, but they often uh, incur a larger cost to actually get everything set up. I can see some questions coming. Let me just open the chat. Okay, I'll come back to uh, come back to that. Um, so if it's about video, um, you've got Vidyard and Loom. If you're not familiar with those, definitely check checking those out. Um, Personalized experiences, again, you'd probably want to work with, you, again, if your deal size is large enough and you have a team to support you with this, segment, clear bit, and convert flow can, can enable you to create these really customized experiences. Um, and then launch and setup. So this is what the, uh, the sequence or the cadence looks like in, your, in the sales engagement platform. So you can see that you can put in these different steps and the system will automate the sending of the emails for you. But then when it's something like um, LinkedIn engagement, for example, it assigns a task for you to go and do it. So you, would, uh, you can put in their LinkedIn link, click on the link and then go and engage on their profile. And then it will just move on to the next step. All of these platforms pretty much work the same way. Um, but if you have any questions about what the right one is for you, my email address will be at the end of these slides and you can just ping me a message. Oh, Ryan's saying, if anyone wants to try out Lemlist, uh, work to deal with Guillaume. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Lemlist is, is, a, is a great place to start. Um, so a lot of people are also asking about measurement and reporting. Um, so just to confirm, the open rate is the percentage of emails that have been opened. Um, the reply rate is the number of emails that have been replied to. Conversion rate is typically um, the percentage of people who, have co who converted into a new opportunity. So you had a positive engagement with them. They're interested in finding out more and they've perhaps booked a call if that's the next step in your sales process or they've arranged a demo. Uh, and closed one is the amount of business that you've generated back. So you work backwards from these numbers. And I want to share some typical results. Um, this was shared on, on LinkedIn about, uh, about a year ago, I think. 
So if you just send a templated email with no personalization, or with a little bit of personalization, so like high first name, you can expect a 1.5% reply rate. If you send a well-researched and targeted email that's personalized at the account level and the contact level or the individual level, you can expect around a 20% reply rate. Um, include not only highly targeted emails, but double tapping them with calls and that LinkedIn engagement and send at least eight emails and have at least three calls, it's a 50% reply rate. And then doing all the above, plus using your personality, maybe add a video and or direct mail can get you up to 70% reply rate. Um, and this is kind of like the elite level. If you do all this and build your personal brand on LinkedIn, so your prospects know who you are and see you as an authority in the space that you're selling into, then you can get around an 80% um, 80 reply rate. And the most important is to repeat. So learn, iterate, and repeat. Once you get it right for one campaign, the process is more or less the same for, for all campaigns. So let's say you started just targeting marketers, but your product can also be sold to salespeople. Then you can run a separate, a new campaign to salespeople. And because you've done most of the hard work in the planning and the messaging, you just need to tweak and amend the copy. Um, to scale your outbound campaigns, you want to really run multiple campaigns. At the time I put this presentation, we ran several different campaigns on, um, uh, for, for Task Drive. We targeted people who are currently recruiting, recruiting for people who had uh, just started a new role, um, the reverse IP lookup. So there are different ways that you can do it. So rather than sending out one campaign with a thousand message, with, with a fact to a thousand people, we started sending out smaller campaigns to smaller amounts of people. Um, and we sent them out on a, a, like a smaller volume per week. And just to give an example of a, of a social con of, uh, sorry, a social campaign we did, I sent out 60 messages. And it, this is a comment based on somebody who liked an influence, an influencer's post. I sent out 60 messages. I got 30 replies, which led to 12 meetings. And actually I closed four deals off those, off those 12 meetings. Um, but all I had to do was send 60 emails rather than the 600 or 6,000 emails if I was getting a 1.5% reply rate. So I'm, I am rushing it a little bit now because I'm conscious of time, but um, we've got the four stages, planning, research, message, and launch. And by in, in conclusion, give first by offering value, find people that are in the market and build dynamic lists, personalize your outreach to connect with a human. Mariachi bands are awesome and I will send them to an office one day. And also have fun with it as well. Um, it's all an experiment. It's all a learning process. And um, I think it's one of the, the best parts of, of working in sales is that you get to interact with so many people through your messaging and through your copy. And um, if you would like to check out Task Drive, there's no obligation for you to do so. You can click on taskdrive.com forward slash mark free trial um, or pop that information, uh, pop that into um, your the address bar. And you can just apply, fill in the details and apply and they'll, they'll give you 25 free leads and there's, there's no obligation there. Um, Ryan, that's it for this, um, this presentation. Um, I think I've, got, I've probably got about five minutes for questions and a break. Perfect, that was, that was <laughs> really good, mate, really good. Um, lots of stuff in there. There's a, there's a couple of questions here. 